at this point, you've got to remind yourself that this is the guy that sat sort of editing Bohemian Rhapsody on quarter-inch tape, you know, with a razor blade through the night at Trident Studios. Hello. Hi, is this Gary? Hi, speaking. Hi. Hi, Gary. It's Brandon calling from the Signals of Intuition in Windsor, Detroit. How are you doing? You okay? How, how goes it? Good? Good. Good, good. Doing all right. How you doing? Not so bad at all. Um, I was going to ask you, when, it, when I get an interview, it's usually uh, America or it's Canada. Where, where are you based? Where, where are you? I'm based in Canada, right across the river from Detroit. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Lovely part of the world then, yeah? Um, yeah, it's not too bad. It's one of the warmest places in Canada, which is nice. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. Well, it's, uh, it's not so pleasant here today because it's raining, but in, uh, in the north of England, it tends to be a little bit like that for, for, for most of the sort of the January, February time. So, uh, you know, there we go. So you're probably getting it better than we are. Um, we just had a snowstorm yesterday, <laughs> so, oh, fantastic. which is only the second snow we've had this year. It's kind of nice. Uh, down here, we get spared a lot of the bad weather, which is nice. Oh, that's great, though. Hey? I mean, so you, you said like... Northern England. Where, where are you based? Um, I'm in Blackpool, which is um, a coastal town in the north of England. But originally, I'm from I'm born in Manchester. So, you know, so I'm in the northwest, if you like, of England. So, uh, yeah, yeah. But we don't get so much snow either. Very rare occurrence here. Usually it doesn't last very long, it turns to slush, and then we, we don't get to do the, the sledding and skiing like you guys will. Yeah. Well, it's funny. A, a friend of mine likes to say, you know, in the UK in general, I mean, we only get sun about five days a year. So he's like, every, every oh, yeah, time yeah, in the yeah. UK there's sun, the newspaper always prints, you know, big yellow orb in the sky today. Go outside and look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Heat wave. Yeah. Heat wave. Host pipe ban. That's the that's what We get a run of three days heat, and then all of a sudden the host pipe ban, and we can't we can't use water on our gardens and all sorts of things. It's crazy. But similarly, we have the other way around, where we have the slightest smattering, sort of sprinkling of snow, and then the airports are, are brought to a standstill, and you know because we we've just not got the infrastructures to deal with it. So yeah, it, it's a bit like that in the UK, but hey ho. You know, yeah, there we go. It's funny because in the U.S. they always say that as well. Once you start to get about midway down toward the south, they have no idea how to deal with snow, which <laughs> makes sense. You know, if you're not designed for it and you haven't planned for it, mm. it hits you that much harder. Yeah, yeah, it is. But it's lovely to talk to you anyway. It's lovely to get the opportunity to speak to you. So that's great. Oh, looking forward thanks. to it. Same here. Um, so you had mentioned growing up in Manchester, and when I do these, I always like to start at the beginning of you as a musician and then work our way up to the new record. Mm -hmm. So I guess starting from the beginning, uh, where did you grow up and how did you get started in music? Well, I, I grew up in a, a little town called Sale, which is a sort of suburb of uh, Manchester. And um, it was one of those situations where I always had this little penchant for writing songs even from a very early age you, you know I um, started to play with a, a little sort of a mandolin I had initially and then I remember having a, a small guitar you know a sort of a, a three-quarter scale guitar and, and it started that way yeah um, I ended up going to an old boys school we had a very sort of a strict upbringing where I came from we had still had something called grammar schools uh, which were either all boys or all girls so there was no you know it was completely segregated when we were growing up there and uh, while I was at grammar school, I decided to do music, study music outside of, of the school on a Wednesday afternoon and a Saturday morning, which were normally our, our school days. And uh, I used to go to somewhere called the Royal Northern College, which was in Manchester, to study music theory and practical. So I did that for a while, all obviously contributing to the you know, to the, the sort of end result of wanting to be as good as I could on, you know, on a, as far as a songwriter was concerned and also to be able to accompany myself when I was actually songwriting, whether that be on piano or whether that be on guitar. So uh, I did that for a, a number of years. And then uh, when I came out of school, I, I actually, my A-levels, if you like, or my advanced levels were, were all in building drawing and technical drawing. Um, so I actually got myself a job as a, what we would call a draftsman. You would probably say an architect. People oh, yep. that were doing drawings for buildings and railways and whatever else. And um, worked for them for a few years. And then, but I continued the songwriting. And uh, I, I was lucky enough to have a batch of my songs, um, which a friend of mine actually sent to a, chap, a Warner Chapel Publishing. 
and they came out and they said, you know, we were looking for songs for different artists and and they liked this song and they liked that song. But the more songs that I sent over, the more they were saying, look, you really need to be looking at doing an album in your own right here. And they had connections at the time with Polygram. So I ended up doing an album called Strength of Heart for Polygram Music, which was sold initially in the Scandinavian territories and then sort of sold on again to EMI Electrola in Germany. So my solo career, how, how does that album, just to cut you off, how does that album go from Big Bad Wolf and turning into Strength of Heart? Because it's basically the same record with a few extra tracks, as I understand it. Yeah, it was. Well, essentially, the, the situation was that they, Polygram Norway put it out initially as Big Bad Wolf. And the thinking at that point was that it was going to be, I was going to be a singer in a, a band called Big Bad Wolf at the time. We were sort of in the back end of the 80s and and lots of bands were doing well, you know, bands like Slaughter and bands like uh, Warren and things like that were doing really well and then they were just sort of getting, making some major money for the, for the American labels and they thought they would saw it as a band and then, but then they realized that they didn't feel it had a, a single on it. Having said that, it still had, you know, I felt it still had singles on it, but they made me add songs to it basically and one of those songs was Strength of Heart and they re- reissued it as a strength of heart. So if anybody does have a, an original copy, a CD copy of Big Bad Wolf, it's worth quite a lot of money now. So I think they only press, they only press 3,000 of those. So Jeez. if you've got one of those, <laughs> treasure it. Um, and they put it out. But then in, then ironically, they released two singles from that. Well, they released three singles from it, which did well in the Scandinavian sort of uh, singles charts. One of them was with the new song, Strength of Heart, but the other two were Christine and Stay, which were another two ballads from that album that were already on Big Bad Wolf. So, which made me kind of think at the time, well, why didn't they just go ahead and release one of those songs to begin with? And But it was what it was. And then... Uh, I met this mogul from Germany, this uh, who was working for him, Alec Troller, called Billy Red, he was called. And um, he basically said, look, I want this album coming over to him, Alec Troller, we'll put it out on the Mercury label, and we just see how it goes from there. So that's how it worked. Following that, a company called Now and Then Records basically said, well, you know, we like we love the Big Bad Wolf. We, they, they had copies of that. They said the strength of heart situation was really very good did they have any follow-up material would have been interested in doing a, a, an album for them and at that point i'd kind of almost been dropped by ema electron there was no news with regard to a new recording so i said well yeah you know there's no ties they sort of established that there was no further plans for me at electron so i ended up doing the, the first self-titled gary hughes album if you like for them which was kind of a collection of songs that i'd had hanging about since some before Strength of Heart and some after. And then once we put that out, they said that was their first album. That was their double zero one album, if you like, the Now and Then album. And they said, look, can you start working on maybe a ballads album, maybe a rockers album? So I started this batch of songs, uh, at which point they said, well, I said, I'm going to do some, obviously some rhythm guitars myself. But he said, have you thought about bringing some musicians in? So at the time, was a band in the north of England that were doing well called Dare. Big fan. Yep. Um, yeah. And um, Vinny was just, he just left Dare. So it was a situation of, oh, Vinny's available. And I'd met, funnily enough, I'd met Vinny in, in a couple of nightclubs. Uh, so I, we were kind of, we knew of each other. We'd had conversations. And they brought Vinny in and also brought Greg Morgan in from Dare to do the drums. So, it was a funny situation because originally he was supposed to be coming in simply to do a, if you like, a session on the material. And in the end, when we'd finished the material, I was looking at it and I was like, you know, this sounds feels like a band now. It sounds like a band. Why do you, you know, this should really be coming out under a band logo. Uh, now and then got excited about that because they thought, well, bands invariably sell more records than solo acts. So unless you're someone like Brian Adams. So, <laughs> Uh, so they said, yeah, let's do uh, a couple of albums. Let's, instead of doing a rockers and a ballads album, let's divide them up. Let's make the first, well, essentially became the first 10 record and name it The Rose. So, and the rest built up from there, really. Obviously, so many albums in now, it's almost difficult to count. But uh, yeah, we, we keep going and that's how 10 began. 
Oh, perfect. So just to dive back in time a little bit, when doing research for this interview, I stumbled on an interview of you being interviewed on MTV Europe around 1992, I want to say or so. Yeah, was that Headbangers Ball, was it? I think so, yeah. Yeah, that sounds yeah, right. Yeah. And one of the things you'd said was your at the time what would have been your next album was going to be done with James Christian from House of Lords, uh, who actually interviewed mm-hmm. not that long ago. But did anything become of that project, or did those songs just get absorbed by Ten? No. Well, I, well, I was a great fan of the whole House of Lords thing. I mean, that was massive over here. It was just I liked the guy's voice and I liked his approach to production and the, the way he sounded. Obviously, myself, not having one of those voices that you would, I don't know, you wouldn't really describe me as a screamer. And range-wise, you know, I don't have the range of sort of the, sort of the real operatic-style uh, vocalist. And I I saw myself and him as, I, I saw myself more in the style of James, James Christian because obviously he has the, the rasp, but he has, he has the range, but he also, he has a very sort of low-end, you know, a nice low-end tone really a rich voice if you like mm. so i i like that and i like the way that they were able to on the on the house of lords of records and able to to give the voice still space still room within the track even though it wasn't the highest vocal in the world because sometimes with sort of technically with a with a range like mine sometimes it, it can clash frequency wise with things like the rhythm guitars things like the keyboards you know you're not really sitting a proud above those things a lot of the time yeah uh, and so he seemed like a great option for producing the record. Uh, we'd had a couple of dialogues, and, and I'd obviously met him at the Gods concert. That I think that Ed Banger's Ball, that you, you will have seen, was, was recorded at the Gods concerts when I think it was James Christian, Jeff Paris, and Mark Free, the, those types of... of, of that, you, you'd mentioned Jeff Paris in it, so yeah, I, I think um, that would have been that. And so um, he just seemed like the natural choice, but funnily enough, when Ed prepared the songs and got them in demo form uh, we sent them to a studio called master tone in london who and one of the in-house producers there was mike stone that was that's my um, next question so <laughs> who, yeah 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 so um and it was sent out to him and obviously we weren't in a situation there where now and then being a fairly new label we only had the revenue that we made off the first solo record and we also outlaid at that point considerably to be able to record the drums and the guitars with Vinny and Greg. And they were saying, you know, well, we've not, it's not an endless part of money. This we're just beginning. Um, let's just see what they think of the material. And Mike at that point, it was fantastic because both Vinny and I went down to London with Mark Ashton, who was the CEO of, of Now and Then. And we actually had a meet with um, Mike Stone and his manager. And his manager was talking in terms of it being, I don't know, £20,000 or £25,000, which was a lot of money for us at the time to be able oh, to mix sure. the first 10 record. And um, Mike basically cut him dead in the, in, the, in the conversation. He said, look, I'm prepared to do this one. Um, I'll tell you what, if we're going to do two records here, let's do them in a stepped way. Let's release, the, let's mix and, re- and, and finish the first one. I'll do that for nothing. He said, and then we'll talk, you know, a financial arrangement over the second release. You guarantee me that we're going to do both albums and we'll see, we'll talk some money on the second one. We couldn't believe our luck, as you can imagine. Oh, no kidding. And it was a situation where he did it. You know, the first album got placed with Zero Corporation in Japan. We were then able to, at least if we weren't in a position to pay him what, what he was used to being paid, we could pay him something, you know, that wasn't too shabby for the second record. And of course he did that, those two albums on the road with us. And incidentally, the, it was a strange situation for us because we were still sort of picking up in Europe. We had, ironically, we had Frontiers distributing us in Europe at that point in time. And we had another company called MTM who was owned by a German, the captain of the German football team, Thomas Hessler. Oh, that's crazy. I've got a ton of MTM stuff. I didn't realize there was a yeah. connection. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, Mario Lehman as well it was his partner in there. They were distributing us, but at the same time, we needed that big push. And it was ironic because the first album, when it came out in Japan, I think the label Zero Corporation had pressed some, a couple of thousand copies of it. 
And he, he went up in 11s. The first album did 11,000 copies on day one, so they couldn't meet the demand of what the album did. Wow. Then they pressed 11,000 or thereabouts for the second album, and it did 22 on day one. So then they were, they were behind again. So the first three albums that we did with Mike went up in literally in 11s. 11, 22, 33. The Rogue did 33 on day one and in the warm territory. So when you're selling those numbers, although they're not like, you know, dream theater figures, at the end of the day, it does make a lot of things more viable. You know, you, you're in a situation where you, you can afford to make a couple of videos. You can maybe afford to speculate a tiny bit to be able to accumulate further. So, and that was brilliant for us. And, and I honestly say, I know we kind of got to a stage where the zero corporation thing came to an end. And they went into receivership. So uh, being a part of EMI, I think they just basically decided that that had its legs. So we were sold on to Universal in Japan, onto their label. And at the same time, now and then closed, and they were sort of absorbed by Frontiers. Frontiers then became a label rather than a distributor. So by the time we got to Spellbound album, it was all changed. We were kind of Half the brain is saying, you know, we're now on a major label, whereas half the brain saying, oh, well, we like the comfort of being a big fish in a small pond. So you're dealing with that kind of thing. But at that stage, you're in a situation where you know you're selling a certain amount of albums, sometimes to the same fans, you know, sometimes the sales went up, sometimes they didn't. But but again, at a time, it's a very weird thing because we're, we're very proud of the fact that we've sort of endured during that period. Because if you think about it, we're, we're kind of... Uh, post grunge you know what we were doing wasn't particularly vogue it's not certainly not a universal you know most of the major labels have stepped away from it for other things and even to this day we're quite proud of the fact that we've managed to endure during a period of time when probably it wasn't that pop you know it wasn't that sort of vogue to or, or this particular genre wasn't that popular um, but we managed to endure when when some great bands that we we met along the way and that we even artists that I work with along the way have fallen by the wayside and you think to yourself, well, you know, we've we've done pretty good really to last this amount of time and still be around, you know, half probably to our own credit, but half to the, the annoyance of probably some others who wish we'd perished years ago, but uh, but we certainly haven't and we're still around. So it's a, a kind of a little bit of a disjointed beginnings but uh we've managed to enjoy and we're, and we're still here <laughs> yeah that's funny uh one singer i interviewed a couple of years ago he had a great line he said you know there's something about sort of melodic rock hair metal you know that that thing he mm. said it's the strangest thing he said it just it refuses to die it's being kept alive by a cult yeah, who it love it yeah. and keep it going it is it is perfect i couldn't have phrased it that's myself perfect so I uh, I first became aware of the band Ten when I blind bought a copy of the EP of uh, Name of the Rose. Uh, what uh, do you remember about working on this song, and how did it compare against the first one? You know, or was it basically just an exact continuation of what you were already doing? Yeah, it was um, it was a strange thing because that first two we we have this habit every now and again of recording songs in batches, and. As I sort of alluded to earlier, we, we, those originally were going to be a ballads album and a rockers album. So if you imagine all the ballads of those first two albums were originally going to be on one record and vice versa. Um, so it was really just a case of uh, making sure the division was good between the tracks that we had available. We had, we had some tracks left over as well, which we used as B-sides and various things. But it was a case of getting the balance correct on both records. And it was really Mike Stone that pushed the name of the Rose thing because Originally, that was going to be a, a kind of a, a prelude and then the song. And it was Mike that said, no, we'll make, just make the prelude part of the song. But at this point, you've got to remind yourself that this is the guy that sat sort of editing Bohemian Rhapsody on quarter-inch tape. Yeah. You know, with a razor blade through the night at Trident Studios. So he's kind of, you've got to remember where he came from. And he was saying, this is epic. You know, it's a long song, but who cares? It's a long song. You know, label were going, well, you know, I'm going to stroll for radio play with this, you know. So, no, 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 no. Doing this entirety, they can always do an edit and put something else out. So he was pushing for that, really. 
But um, it was really when we were coming to the close of that, we were at a studio called Star Tracks in Manchester. And um, it was during the Euro 96 football tournament, that, that uh, the international tournament that was happening. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, Thomas Hessler, he was over with the German squad and they were staying in basically in Bowdoin, which is not far from Manchester. It's one of the suburbs of Manchester. We get this call one day. Many of those was very much sort of in, in production, but it was very sort of, it, it was unfinished. It wasn't what we were happy with. You know, we weren't happy. It was completely finished at that point. Yeah, and, it's sort uh, of partly recorded and still needs to be mixed. Yeah, and, still needs to. But we get this call, and basically it's, in, it's, the, it's basically they're, they're bored in the hotel between these games that they're playing. They're, basically, they're actually playing their, most of their sort of group games at, at Old Trafford, which is Manchester United's game in Manchester, Manchester United's um, stadium in Manchester. So they're not a million miles away. And um, they said, oh, look, any chance we can come into the studio and just sit and listen? And they, we like had this situation where this particular morning, this the two sort of Mercedes turned up with two guys, two security guys who come in the studio and they walk around the studio and they check that it's all completely clear. And then all of a sudden, these Thomas Hessler comes in with about four of the German footballers, um, Jürgen Klinsmann being one of them, and uh, Thomas Trumps and, and, and uh, Max Babel, I think, as well, came. And they basically just spent the whole day listening to music and mixes and listening to things and just having a general vibe with the band in there. We ordered food in and whatever, and it was it was great. But while we were there, Thomas took a, a monitor mix of Name of the Rose and another song called When Only Love Can Ease the Pain, which was going to be one of the big ballads on the Name of the Rose album. We got it back to, after the tour, we got it back to Germany. We're still finishing off the recordings and we get this news that Thomas has actually included the When Only Love Can Ease the Pain on an EP that MTM were putting out as like a sampler. I'm like, oh my God, no, this is the big ballad off Name of the Rose. So at that point, it puts in a bit of a conundrum. But also, we were just so glad that he didn't put Name of the Rose out there because it wasn't finished at that point. It was just a mix that he'd been given that was sort of a half mix, if you like. So it was a little bit of a problem child for us as well, Name of the Rose, because it almost came out in a format that we wouldn't have wished it to come out before it was finished. So I always had a feeling with that song that there would be something different about it and it would it would do good things when it came out and it would be something unusual simply because it had such a troublesome birth, if you like, you know, a, a coloured, a checkered birth. So, um, yeah, it's, it, I think that in lots of ways as well set the tone for a lot of our opening tracks, if you like, on sort of albums that ensued because we then got into this because we'd had the, the Crusades into It's All About Love on the first record and then all of a sudden we had this sort of overture into Name of the Rose on the second. It opened the way really for then the robe happened and we had the voiceovers and then we had the big epic robe track. So each 10 albums since has always featured kind of a more epic track at the beginning, usually with some kind of musical interlude and then bang, in we go with the track. We kind of made it a little, I suppose, a little bit of a trademark, but I know, I know we're not the only band that does it, but uh, that sort of lent to the sort of the flavor of lots of different albums that came after. Um, one album I've always been curious is um, Tony Mills is a good friend of mine. And you produced uh, the Serpentine album, Circle of Knives, and he sang for the band for the first two records. He did, yeah. Tell me how you got involved with producing them. Like, I know you guys use the same mix engineer that he had used on a few albums in Serpentine. And how did you get involved with that band and working mm. on that album? Well, really, to be honest with you, um, Tony was quite instrumental in that. Um, Tony's from the sort of the Midlands. Um, here in, in the UK and we'd come across each other as you tend to do at festivals and backstage areas and green rooms and whatever as a big fan I saw he had a sort of immense range with his voice and, and I liked the way he looked at music from a very sort of if you like a multifaceted standpoint I had a great deal of respect for Tony Mills and he was I remember at the time he was sort of he was working with these guys working with the Serpentine guys and Gareth and Chris, they were the very young guys. I mean, we were talking about 19, 20 year old guys when they started working with Tony on that particular, on the Serpentine project. And he really was like the father figure. He took them under his wing and everything. And I remember meeting him, well, several times during the first two Serpentine albums when they were promoting those. And he was talking about how he really felt that the band had much more potential than they'd ever 
really been able to sort of put into a, any real terms. And he said, you know, there's still so much in there that we're trying to pull out. And then, of course, he got a, a catastrophic diagnosis that he got. And he said, oh, who are they going to get into sync? It's going to have to be somebody who has range, obviously. But he said, don't let him. <laughs> and I remember him saying to me, don't let him get in the wrong guy. You know, we've got a set of flavor now. It's quite unique what we're doing. Don't let him get the wrong guy. And he said, would you be interested in working with them now? At that point, as you know, they've been they've done some recordings and mixings at Mad Hat, and they'd also done some stuff. They were playing with the idea of using different mix mix engineers. And in the end, obviously, the the whole thing that happened with Tony was tragic as it was. Uh, brought close to that, but um, we'd managed. I'd managed to talk to the guys about a situation of doing some co-writing with them, and sort of filling the gaps that Tony would have filled in in the first two records, if you like. So we ended up with this like triumvirate of the three of us, Chris, uh, Gareth and myself, doing the bulk of the writing on the record. And it was a nice for me to be able to continue, if you like, some kind of legacy with these guys because it, w- it would have been too sad to see it all finish there. And um, and in a way, I felt I had a, a, an obligation to him. I'd made him kind of a promise anyway then, and I'm not the kind of guy that wouldn't stick to a promise. And so I said, well, we're going to do it. We're going to see how it goes. We're going to do the best we can. And I think we we were pleased with the end result. I think we were chuffed with the end result and the way it came out. There was a few different things that happened beyond that with a, a, a slight sort of breakup or a, a little bit of a an altercation, a verbal altercation between Chris and Gareth that sort of brought this whole Serpentine thing to an end. And that's probably why there's never been a fourth record. Um, but I, they're good friends now, but it was at the time, it was quite heated. But at least we made that third album. And at least, you know, we stuck to the promise that he didn't all finish when Tony finished. But I think he felt that they had more talent than they were given credit for, but that they needed the glue they needed the sort of the Tony Mills glue to make the Serpentine thing. And, and I think just for a time, even if just for one album, I took over the glue responsibilities for that Circle of Knives album. But it was nice to sort of do that with them. Uh, and in fact, funny enough, I've done a, a project for a tail project for a singer called Karen Fell, who Chris Gould from Serpentine did the guitars on that record. And, um, and also... My guitar player uh, in 10, Dan, one of the guitar players, Dan Ross and Garner, his brother Dave, who's a bass player, also played on that tail record. So it's been nice to be able to continue to work with Chris on some level, you know, going forward as well. So uh, so hopefully we can continue to sort of add to their reputations as musicians and, and uh, you know, give them some of the credit that they deserve. It's one of these things where... I think they're the first band I've written for since Bob Catley, really. You know, so I'm pleased with the way that the album came out, based, you know, with the songwriting and the performances. The singer has an absolutely stellar voice, brilliant voice. And Chris, again, he, he shows that melodic sort of tinge to everything he's doing on the on the guitars. Oh, fantastic. So, about 10 years ago or so, you guys started working with who's probably my favorite mix engineer, Dennis Ward. How did you start working with him? And when it comes to working with him, is he strictly a mix engineer or do you have him produce or send ideas or how, how do you work with him? Well, with us, I mean, he's, he's a consummate professional, so he's capable of everything. Trust me, this guy is uh, pretty much a genius when it comes to our genre of rock or, or, you know, several genres of rock. I was fortunate enough to begin working with him for the Storm Warning record. I think it's 2.11 that we started working together. And um, it's one of those things, we, we've used him for each album since, but when you get to, the, you know, yourself, when you're working with a, working with guys that you kind of, you know instantly, they they get you, you know, they get you completely and they know exactly what you're looking for. And I'm a big believer in, um, if it isn't broke, what's the point fixing it? So, um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we, we stay with it. That's why we've never really strayed beyond 211 since we started working with Dennis. This time, he's been more instrumental than ever, really, because the two new albums, if you like, the Here Be Monsters and the Something We Could This Way Comes albums, were recorded again, as we, we tend to do periodically. We recorded in one batch, trying to make, if you like, maximize the lockdown time, because... I mean, everybody had it the same. I know you guys were the same, but we had it where we couldn't. We could take an hour's exercise every day. We couldn't go more than two kilometers from the house. You know, really locked down. Um, but fortunately, we all have 
sort of little mini studios in our houses. So we were able to work on material and, and sort of maximize the, the productivity, if you like, or our proactivity during what was essentially, I suppose, a bit of a, a period of limbo for most of the world. But the only thing we couldn't record was drums, and because none of us have the space to record the drums, so we recorded both albums essentially to um, program drums, thinking, okay, what we'll do down the line is we'll play some of the live kit, away we go. Now, during lockdown, our drummer, Max Yates, he decided, well, he had the baby boy started to begin his family, and he decided that this was the time he would step out, basically. He said, oh, I want to sort of devote more time to the family, you know. He'd been um, on, his baby boy had been born through IVF. So it had been quite a battle for himself and his wife to be able to have a child in the first place. And, and now that they had the baby, they, he said, this is it, now I'm spending the time with the family. So we totally got that. But of course, we still have deadlines. We still have contracted deadline, contractual delivery dates for different things. So I said to Dennis, I said, look, you know, I said, I, I really don't want to have to, delay or, or reschedule the mixes because I know you've put the time in your own diary to mix them but I haven't got a drummer at the moment so I can't do the, I can't get the drums done for you over here I can't get them and at that point he was the one that said well I do have sort of several session drummers that walk through my studio one guy in particular Marcus Gorman I know could knock this off could knock both albums off in a, in a week or 10 days something like that so, of course, when Dennis says something like that, and knowing what he's done in the industry, you think, well, I can trust that. He knows he can get the performances out of the guy. So although I'd never met at that point, I'd never met Marcus, I just said, yeah, let's go for it. You know, if he doesn't delay, then don't delay the mix of the first record, doesn't hold Dennis up at all. Because I knew that he had some magnum dates coming up and various different things that he was committed to. So my slot was precious with him, you know, as it always is. So, yeah, he brought Marcus Coleman in. He was instrumental in doing that. So he helped the band out immensely there because we've just got another drummer now. But, you know, we didn't have, and it could have put both those albums basically on the slab now for another, another 12, 18 months, you know, which didn't happen because Marcus came in, did a brilliant job. Dennis then mixed to his usual um, brilliant quality. I mean, he's, he's one of them guys as well. You know, you can have a, what I like about Dennis is, he reminds me a lot in a way of Mike Stone in just how laid back he is. If it was any more laid back, he'd be horizontal. You know, he's, he's <laughs> one of those guys. And he kind of, he always has an answer. You know, even when as an artist, you're getting a bit fractious with it or you're getting a bit, you're in a pressured situation, you know, he's always the guy that says, hey, just take a step back, take a breath. We'll deal with this. We'll get this through. We'll deal with that. And he's done that so many times with me over the past 13 years, uh, 12 years that, you know, I, I lost count. So he knows me very well now. I know him very well. And it's just, it works. So, you know, that's why we do it. But um, as I say, not only is he the most sort of consummate professional I think I've ever come across in this in this area of, of expertise, but he's also such a nice guy. And I think that's, that in itself is, is speaks volumes, really. That's, uh, you know, more, more than any reason um, why we continue. So tell me about the band's writing process today. Now, is it still, do you write everything? Does each member come in with some ideas or how, what's your process like for writing and recording? Um, it, it's still at this stage, it, it is me writing essentially. But what, what it tends to be, I mean, the guys, they all write in separate ways and, and do different things, but they've ne they never submit. It's got to the stage where they don't submit anything through for 10 now. But what we do is basically when I've written a song, if you like a lyric or a melody down a chord, and I present them to the guys, it's literally everybody Everybody does their own thing beyond that. So in other words, the bass player is writing his own parts. You know, Dan's right. Dan or Steve are both writing their own solos. You know, nobody's sitting on anybody's shoulder to do that bit or whatever. They just do their own thing to instrument to, to add instrumentation. Similarly with Daryl, if he's got a vibe that he's going to go with a symphonic sort of a string thing at the beginning, we just roll with it. You know, we it becomes, if you like, a bit of its own beast then. Each of the songs sort of treated separately so that they evolve separately and they also evolve into their own animal. So, uh, yeah, that's the way we work it. And it's it's worked for so many years now that it's just a process. I think it's it spawned partly as well because I think I probably have more time than the other guys to, to actually commit to the actual writing side of it. It's one of those things, and it's, it's just, it is what it is, but it works for us. And uh, I think as well, you get into that sort of, 
that mode as well. I mean, I had a conversation with one of the Daryl keyboard player the other day. I said, you know, it's, you know, because I'm already working. Uh, I have one of these little MP3 recorder things that essentially records bits of, uh, you know, ideas, vocal ideas. And it, they're, they're, they're a blessing, but they're a curse at the same time because you can find yourself in the middle of the night getting up to use the bathroom and, <laughs> and you just get hit by this idea. And so I'm sat there, you know, or stood there putting ideas down. So it, it is a bit of a curse in that, in that respect. But I'm already working on, you know, even though we've just, you know, something wicked is just coming out now, you know, I'm already working on the next and the next and the next, you know. So, um, and because... Just, I, you're just one of those guys, you never stop writing. Yeah, but the, but the other guys, they kind of, they I think they get it now that they, they've all got such busy lives as well that they don't, they're not particularly prolific. And, and they also, I think they struggle sometimes to, to develop the time to actually just sit down and do it. So, and, and also there's an element of, we've done so well so far what if we start to change that that blend now do we you know what if it's not as good or what if whatever so we, we leave it the way it is and it just is what it is you know everybody's a different animal and and i do what i do and they do what they do do you have any more 10 albums or solo albums officially planned or is it just you're just writing songs and at some point something will happen with it yeah well funnily enough we've come to um the, the the last contract with Frontiers was for two albums, and uh, we just tend to sign us for two albums at a time. And it's a funny thing, you know, we're all in our 50s now, so it's one of those where you feel, you know, how long we're going to continue. Don't get me wrong, as, as long as they ask us to make records, we'll keep making records. But you, you've got to ask yourself, well, there's going to come an end point at some point, probably. So you never quite believe it when another deal's offered and, and they say, oh, let's make another one. But it's like a tour manager once said to me, if you put your sales together worldwide and you put all those people in the football, in a couple of football stadiums, it's worth making a record. So that's what we, that's the way we look at it. And so, yeah, we, we, we're planning for another record. We, we, we still have gaps. I mean, I know we've done a lot of records. But we still have gaps as far as we're concerned in our anthology. We don't have a live DVD yet, which we'd like to do because, um, you know, we want people to see what the whole thing is, get a whole, the whole histrionic thing, the, the new stuff and the old stuff. We want the whole storytelling in some way, shape or form on film before, before we shuffle off, if you like. For sure. Well, that's it. I mean, you guys last had a live album 25 years ago or something, right? So yeah, we did, we did indeed. And, and so something like that would be good. We'd also like to do like, um, if you get into a studio and we set up what we set up as a band, we'd like to do something where we play through some of the, what would be considered to be our hits, if you like, and just play those in a studio setting, but set up as a band, maybe, maybe video that as well, and maybe do some kind of album release off the back of that as well. We've never done as such in a, uh, considering we, we always have a couple of ballads on every album, we've never done an acoustic album. We've never done that album that you would put on as background music to when you're having a nice sort of romantic night in or something like that. So, you know, these are all things that we'd like to do at some point. Um, but there's still like quite a lot of fire in the belly. You know, we'd, the beauty of the fact that tens evolved over the years is that, you know, musicians have come and gone. We've I've been blessed with working with some of the, you know, some of the most technically gifted people that I know. And we've evolved. So the new guys coming in, like, for instance, Dan now, is, uh, Dan and Steve, who have been in with us since Albion now, you know, they're, they're a good sort of six albums in now, but they're, they're really hungry. You know, they're not sat at the end of 16 albums. They're sat at the end of six, and they, they want to make more records. So while you're bringing in musicians that still have the hunger, it makes sense to continue and continue. So I'd like to do more another rock opera at some point. I was, you know, happy with the ones of which King ones that I did. I, my only regret with that is that I didn't have a more business-minded outlook towards that because really I should have done that in I should have done that in theaters. Really, we should have done that. Got the original cast and done some shows, maybe with an intermission. Once a few King Part One and then intermission and Part Two. We could, you know, another opportunity for maybe a live DVD or something with something like that. So if I ever did another one of those, because I love writing for other people's voices then I would be looking to maybe be a bit more of a completist with with that, if you like, and make sure that it was more than just the album. You know, that there was a little bit of a projected thing to maybe do some days, allow the fans to see the thing live and something, an offspring from that uh, beyond there. So, yeah, there's lots of different things that are still 
have to do. And uh, sometimes it feels like there's so little time to get to cram it in. But, you know, we, we seem to manage. So, uh, so we'll keep going as long as people still want to hear the music. For sure. Well, Gary, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to do this and hearing these old stories and both diving back in time and talking about, uh, you know, what you guys have going on now. And uh, I'd love to do this again. I'd love to get no you on. Problem. You know, you put out another solo record yeah, or listen, ten or whatever absolutely. you're doing next. I'd love to get you back on. Yeah, let's do it because I, I, you know, it's all about. I, I, it'd be nice to speak again, and we would kind of be almost like old friends now. We kind of, you know, we, we're hooking up again. That would be great. But yeah, I, honestly, thank you very much for your time as well because I know it takes you a lot of time to put these things together. I appreciate the time and I appreciate the, the promotion as well. So thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thanks again, Gary. And yeah, hope to talk to you soon and best of luck with the new record. It's fantastic. Thanks very much indeed. All the very best to you. Cheers, Brandon. Thanks, Gary. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.